Hey everybody, welcome to part 10 of this processing tutorial. In this lesson, we're, we're going to take care of some of the problems we're having with this code up here. So these arrays and the way they're defined. And you're going to learn a little bit more about how to declare arrays. And you're also going to learn how to create random numbers. So putting all that together, we're going to make this code a lot more interesting. So right now, if you remember what we have is seven balls bouncing around the screen. And the location of the balls is controlled by this x, y, these x and y arrays. And then we have x delta and y delta array, which control the direction of the balls. Then down here, we have a for loop, which starts at 0 and will count up to 6. And it, inside this for loop, it draws the ellipse. And then it will move however we want and check if it's hit the edges or not. So this, is, this works pretty well, and it looks nice but it's not very flexible. And what I mean by flexible is if I want to add more balls, I have to write four numbers. If I want to add 50 balls, I'm going to have to write a whole bunch more numbers for each one of these arrays. And in addition, all of these balls are going to start in the exact same location every time I run the program. So notice it starts like this and starts like this. So there's no real random element to this. So if we were to make this into a game uh, where you're popping these balls, then the player is going to know every time exactly where the balls are going to start. And we don't want that. We want it to be, be random. So we're going to use a function called random, and we're going to use a different way of defining these arrays. But I'm not going to show you in this code because this code's already, it, it's a lot here, and it's kind of it might be a little confusing for you. So I'm going to jump over to here. And we're going to do it using a simple example to begin with. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to introduce you to random. So I'm going to delete this right here. And I'm going to pr do print line. And I'm going to use random 0 to, say, 500. OK, so in this loop, remember, initialize to 0. And we count from 0 to 4. And then and when a I++ plus plus gives us a 5, it will stop this loop. So this print statement is going to print 5 times. And each time it's going to run this function that's in here. Now this function is the first function that we've used uh, that returns a value. And in this case, the value is a floating point number. So that means you can think of this function as being replaced each time by the loop by some random floating point number that's, that could be 0 but is less than 500. So if I run this, you'll get five numbers that print out down here. And if you notice, if you run it again, you get five different numbers. So random really is random for the most part. It's called a pseudo random number generator. If you want to look that up, you can. But for, the, for our purposes, it's a random number. So what we want to do with this random number is we want to use this function to fill all of these up with random numbers. And we're going to need to use everything we've learned up till now, plus a little bit more, in order to do that. So first thing I want to do is I, I don't want to have these hard-coded values anymore. I, I want to be able to create everything randomly at the beginning. So let's delete these. And we're going to be just left with the declaration. So this means we've just declared two places in memory that are going to be arrays. So how do we actually then tell the array how many spaces to reserve? So how many boxes it's going to have? How many values will, will it need? Well, you do something like this. x equals new not int float, and let's say 50. So what does this do? Well. In order to understand how this works, we kind of need to understand what this is. Now, before, if I just say float x, that means there's some place in memory that holds a value, and x is telling us where that value is. And that's the same thing as this, except it's not holding a value itself. x and y never hold a value themselves. What they do is they point to a place in memory, a memory address, where that list of 50 items actually starts. So while a float x, a variable by itself, holds an address where the value is stored, x and y with the arrays are pointing to the start 
of all of those boxes. So in memory, when I do this, new 50, it starts at one memory address and will block off 50 spaces for floating point numbers. The X variable points to the starting location of those 50 blocks. All right, so that's probably a little more in depth than we need, but I think it is important to understand how these things work in memory. And if you wanna know more, check out the supplementary material on my website, and I'll, I'll throw in a few links to other websites that talk about pointers and references and, and how things are managed in memory with programming. If you wanna know a lot more about it and you wanna get practice, then I recommend trying to learn the basics of C and C++ and learning how pointers and arrays and things work in those languages. In those languages, you'll get a much better view of how things work at a lower level. In Java and in other la in languages like Python and, and, and things like that, it, it really kind of covers up how things work in the background and that's, that's good, it really is good. But I feel like a lot of people are learning programming without ever, ever being able to touch those basics. And I think in a way those basics still are very relevant and, and very important. All right, so enough of my uh, soap, soapbox speech there. Let's uh, go on and let's create 20 or 50y variables as well. So y spaces for our y values. And we need to fill these value, uh, fill these arrays with values. Because right now they're all initialized to zero. So whenever you do this and you don't put anything in, everything in there is zero. So you can imagine there's 50, 50 blocks of memory and, and 50 blocks in memory, and each one of those blocks is filled with the value of zero. So we can use this nice little random function down here to actually fill those up. So I'm gonna bring this back up here, and I'm going to delete this print line and I'm going to say instead xi is equal to random 0 to 500. So this loop's only running five times right now so I want to make it run 50 so I can fill up the whole xi and I'm going to also use it to fill up y. So random 0 to 500 just like that. So this actually, this program is going to do nothing because, or at least it'll look like it does nothing because we haven't drawn anything to the screen yet. But what I do have now is I have 50 random floating point numbers and then for X and 50 random floating point numbers for Y. So now what we need to do is we're going to loop through again and we are going to draw them. Now you could have said, hey, well, you could just draw them right after this. But I, I want to do this to illustrate an, another point, kind of revise something we talked about last time. So you're going to notice what do these two for loops have in common. So take a look, think about it. And if you said, well, everything inside here is identical. How can you do that? How can you have a variable here and a variable here that are exactly the same. I thought you said you can't have two variables with the same name. And I did say that, but if you remember, I said if they are in the same scope. This for loop is its own scope. Everything between this curly brace and this curly brace are part of the scope. Anything declared in here is part of that scope as well. So we declare i in here and it's used in this for loop, but the minute the program hits here, it completely forgets about i. i is just gone. And when it gets down here and tries to do it again, it says, hey, there's no i, I can create a variable i. Now, if I put int i up here and I ran this, it's going to say duplicate variable. But if I run it as is now, I should get 50 balls drawn on the screen. All right, so how's this really working? Well, the first for loop runs 50 times and fills x and y with random floating point numbers starting, could be at zero, uh, could be up to 500. The second for loop goes back through these two arrays and uses those pairs of x and y values, random numbers, and draws them on the screen. All right, pretty good, right? Well, we have two small issues with this. The first issue is, if we're gonna take this code and go back to our original program, we can't have balls being drawn 
off the screen like this. There can't be anything at the edge of the screen. The balls have to be inside. So if you remember, the balls are 20 pixels in diameter, and the random numbers are going between 0 and 500, and the screen is 500 uh, max. So we don't want the ball to go up to 500. That means the center of the ball can be at 500. We want to move it 10 over, or half the ball, the radius of the ball. So I take this and I make it 490, and I run this again. And notice there's no balls that are going off the edge of this screen. And I can test that again. No balls going off the edge of this screen. There's still balls going maybe off the edge of this. And let's see if I can get one if I run it again. Yep, there we go. So I also need to bump this up by 10 and bump this up by 10. And now no balls are touching any of the edges of the screen. All right. So the other problem with this is I'm using this variable 50 four times, and it's controlling how many balls we have. Now, if I want to change, say I want to draw 500 balls, I have to go in here and do this. And that's just inefficient. And it makes our program not as flexible as we'd like. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable. And this is an integer variable. So I'm going to create an integer, and I'm going to say int number of balls is equal to 500. And then I'm just going to take this, and I'm going to replace all of my 500s with this variable. And I'm going to run the program again, and I get 500 balls, no problem. So now if I wanted 5,000, I only have to change this number up here. So 5,000, let's make 50,000. Not like it'll make too much of a difference, just take longer to run. Look at that. Now, let's go ahead and take this code and move it back to our other program and see what we get. All right, so let's go back here. And we're gonna need to clean this up quite a bit and we're gonna need to expand in the setup section a little. Uh, the first thing we should do is we should get rid of all of these ugly values. So let's go ahead and do that. Ugly values go away, ugly values go away. And we're now left with four declared arrays. If you remember from the last one, we also had number of balls. So let's go ahead and put that in here and let's say 50 to start with. Okay, so now I have these arrays, but they're completely empty at the moment. And if I run this program, it'll give me an error down here. It'll say null pointer exception. What is a null pointer exception? Well, a null pointer exception means we actually haven't put anything in here. And these values, the address these are pointing to in memory is empty. There's nothing in there. I haven't given it a value because I haven't used the new operator to assign a location in memory for the number of balls that I want. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to copy, I'm going to copy both the initializing and this for loop over. And I'm going to put it inside setup. And we want to put it inside setup because we only want to do it one time. If I put it in draw, that means each time the draw loop is called, I'm going to re-declare or reinitialize the, the variables, the floating point arrays, and I'm going to refill them with random numbers. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. And we also need to create these random values. So let's go ahead and copy these because most of the stuff we're doing is really just the same, x delta and y delta. And we can copy these as well. And I can put in x delta and y delta. But there's a problem here. Remember, the ball can start in any of these, any of these locations, but we don't want the speed of the ball to be between 10 and 490. We want it to be much lower, and we actually might even want it to be negative. So I'm going to put a negative 3 and a positive 3 and a positive 3 and a negative 3. There we go. So now our speed was going to be maximum 3, minimum 3 in any given direction. So the ball won't be flying really fast all over the screen. All right, so very good. We've got this initialized, this will create four new arrays, all floating point numbers. Each of them can store 50 things. Each one stores something different, x, y, x delta, y delta. And then we fill them with random numbers using this for loop. And now we want to draw them to the screen. The only thing we have to change down here is this. 
So everything else in our code down here stays the same. We just change the array to run more times. And if I run this program, I will get 50 balls bouncing around the screen. And you're gonna notice this is really nice because every time I start this program, the balls will start in a random location. And if I wanna make less balls or more balls, all I need to do is adjust one number. All right, so that's really nice. You're probably looking at this code and thinking, all right, that's, that looks good, I can, I, can do, I can do all this, no problem. Arrays are really handy, for loops work really well. But later on, we're gonna learn that this code is still really inefficient. This is actually a really bad way to do this in any type of production code. And we'll get to that in a few lessons, but right now, just get used to using arrays and playing with them. And you can go in and, and you can use random in different ways as well. For example, if I took random here, and let's say I said random, let's make a random 10 and, now let's make it random zero to 255. And I ran this. Notice the balls are blinking inside now. And the reason the balls are blinking is because every time I go through this, it's, it's making a new random value for the fill. So you don't have to just put random numbers in arrays. You can actually put them anywhere you want. Like I could put a random stroke weight on here. Random 0 to 100. This will look really weird. So here we got the balls bouncing up. And the balls are still going to bounce off the center, but they're going to give these weird random flashy strobe effect. So play around with the random function and mess with this code a little bit. And try to maybe even create a fifth array up here and use that array to store random values for the color or something. So I encourage you to do that. Check on the website for any supplementary material and other things. I will also from this point on be putting the code on the website. So you can find this code on the website. Later on I'll be putting them as zips when we have more files, but right now it'll just be pasted straight into the post. So put this you can just you can go copy this and feel free to mess with this as much as you want, knowing that you can go to the website and copy it and get it working again. All right, uh, everybody, uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next lesson.